brothers and sisters, I've been doing a series on relationships, courtship, and marriage. And I didn't expect to continue on this week, but as I started studying even for myself, I started realizing that this is a message that has no end. It is just so deep. And the importance is something that is, words cannot express. We as individuals really need to take that time to understand, to study what the Word of God has to say, the counsels that He has to give us in regards to relationships, to courtship, to marriage, to the family, to the home, and to understand that Satan is angry and that he has a specific purpose in destroying the home. In fact, I actually want to read to you a quotation that I have taken from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. Because when you see here, when Satan was cast down from heaven, he comes and he sees Adam and Eve, this happy pair, this beautiful pair. And I want to read something to you where it says, This is in regards to the counsel that, well, before I read that, the, before I read the counsel that God had given to Eve and Adam, you see that Satan, when he was cast down, began to look at this pair, and he had all these angels with him that were cast down, and he could not believe that he had been cast down. He could not believe that this was actually his condition. He thought it to be something that his mind was envisioning. And the very first thing he thought was he had to do something to cause this happy pair to fall. And at first he was afraid to do so. Spirit of Prophecy says that he was hesitant when putting this plan in his mind, where he said, wow, he felt weak and his ability to actually even do anything to them. And he started to change his mind. He started to waver and go back and forth. And he even went to the angels and said, this is what we're gonna do. We have to put a plan forth. And the angels even were hesitant, like we don't want to do that. But he convinced them that this was the only way that they could now have this position that they formerly had. Where God could not cast them out now that they had this garden, they could take over. They could work with Adam and Eve to take over. And he actually had to go by himself. He said, no, you guys stay there. I have to put this plan together myself. He could not trust this plan to those angels. He had to sit down and think of this master plan to overcome them, to attack the home, to attack this happy pair. And this is what I want us to study today because this has been his plan from day one. And he's been so successful, brothers and sisters, so successful. But where does the fault lie? I want us to go to a text in 2 Corinthians. And just so you know, today's title of this uh, message is Marrying and Giving in Marriage Amid Satan's Devices. Amen? Marrying and Giving in Marriage Amid Satan's Devices. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want us to go to verse 9. And read to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Amen? Amen. It says, in verse 9, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Many are falling prey to Satan because they are ignorant of his devices. Do we have a responsibility to study the word of God? so that we can know and be aware of what his devices is. Now, I'm not saying because there are many who take it overboard. There are many who are studying Satan. There are many who are studying what this new world order is and what the Jesuit uh, plan is. And no, we're not to study Satan. We're to study the word of God because everything we need is in his word. But it says that we should not be ignorant to his devices. Now, do these devices have to do with marriage among husbands and wives? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, a few chapters over. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we want to read verse 2 and 4, amen? amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 4. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. 
For I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtly, subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might bear well with him. Brothers and sisters, did the serpent come between Adam and Eve? Was she deceived? What were his devices? For it says here, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, in this first sin, we see Satan attacking not just humankind, but marriage. How? He introduced false doctrine, brothers and sisters, creating a false sense of purpose. And here in this scripture, here in 2 Corinthians, Paul uses deception of Eve as a type of the church being drawn away by a false teacher. Do we see that? Who was this false teacher? God's purpose was that Eve would be taught by Adam, not Adam by Eve. I want us to be very clear in our study today because a lot of people, especially unconverted minds, have the wrong understanding of what it means to submit to your husband, of what it means that your husband is to be the head. Because in our minds we have it, oh, you know, the, the husband wants to control me, the husband wants to, you know, not let me have my individuality. No, brothers and sisters, quite the contrary. God has a purpose. And when we understand our roles according to the gospel, we will have nothing but joy and peace individually and in the home but Satan wanted to adulterate all of this what does adulterate mean it means to change committing adultery is not just uh, cheating on your spouse it is changing what God has designed amen, amen. now before Satan could attack this marriage he had to separate Adam and Eve he had to separate them. Now I want to read something to you here. This is taken from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 34. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 34. God is so loving towards us that he gives us counsel and he repeats it to us because he would not have it so that we are easily led astray. And it says here, the angels cautioned Eve not to separate from her husband in her employment, for she might be brought in contact with this fallen foe. If separated from each other, they would be in greater danger than if both were together. The angels charged them closely to closely follow the instructions God had given them in reference to the tree of knowledge. For in perfect obedience, they were safe. And this fallen foe could then have no power to deceive them. God would not permit Satan to follow the holy pair with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what was the instruction that God had given them? Do not separate from each other. So the only way that Satan could come in between their marriage was by separating them. And you see here where Eve decides to take a little walk in the garden. And Spirit of Prophecy also says that at first she felt a sense of danger. But she convinced herself that no, I'm okay. I have the strength to be able to overcome if any danger comes my way. That's the very first thing that we do. We convince ourselves that in these little matters, we are okay, that we are safe. Even though God has given us counsel upon counsel, especially when it comes to marriage. Now it says, Eve unconsciously at first separated from her husband in her employment when she became aware of the fact that she felt there might be no danger. But again, she thought herself secure. She thought she had the wisdom to know if evil came, how to meet it, even though it says the angels had cautioned her not to do it. So what did, they, what did Satan have to do? Separate them. I want us to turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, amen? Amen. Because Adam was to be the protector or the covering for Eve, amen? Couldn't deceive them while together. So Mark chapter 3, verse 27, amen? amen? 
It says, are we all there? No man can enter into a strong woman's, I'm sorry, into a strong man or woman, a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. How is it that Satan gets us to sin or to fall into temptation? The same way that Satan had to cause a separation between Adam and Eve, he now has to cause a separation between us and Christ. It is when we walk away from Christ or when we ignore those counsels, you have to first bind that strong man. Who was that strong man? Christ Jesus. By binding him through our own choices, now our home can be entered in and our goods can be taken from us. And we see that with the first pair. Amen. But what was Adam's role? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, amen? Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and I want us to read verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. When you look at this preparation that God had given Adam. We went over this in our last couple of messages where God had given him a home. God had given him an occupation and God had given him this garden where he says dress it and keep it and all these things that he gave Adam it was all in preparation for this woman that he was to receive. Now when you look at this garden or when you look at this earth you see that there's a connection between Adam and this earth as a mother to a child because Adam came from the earth right now he came from the earth and out of his side came Eve and we see that the Bible says no man has ever hated his own flesh so the same way that God said you are to now have this garden dress it and keep it and that is the same work of preparation that you now have for your wife you are to dress her you are to keep her how you are to be her covering her protector they were to be together and that way, no temptation could come before them. And this was the only thing Satan could tempt them with. And after that, he could tempt them no longer. He was not going to continue to follow them with these temptations. No, brothers and sisters. But by this one poor judgment that was made, all these woes have come. And brothers and sisters, this is what happened when we separate from Christ and make decisions according to our own will, specifically when it comes to choosing a spouse because we choose it for ourselves. And woes come, not just upon us, but upon even our children. I was listening to a, um, a testimony by uh, Pastor C.D. Brooks. Rest in peace to him. Um, he was giving a testimony about how he had met his wife. And he was saying that the first thing that he noticed about her, I believe they were in school together, I'm not sure, but there were prayer meetings that they used to go to very early in the morning. And this was voluntary. Nobody had to go to those prayer meetings. But he said that every single morning she would be there at these prayer meetings. That was the first thing. And he said, wow, if I was going to find a wife, that is the circle I would want to look at. Those that are coming to the house of God, those that are desiring to worship, those that are desiring to fellowship with like-minded believers. But he continued to watch him. He said, you know, God had chosen me to do a, to have a ministry. There was no question about that. And when it came to a spouse, the same way that God chose him to do this work, he wanted God to choose this wife for him. And so finally, you know, they started to uh, court and they were all through letters. There was no whole hand holding and, you know, having them walk down the street with their arms. No, everything was according to the word of God. And finally, when he wanted to marry her, what did he do? He went to his or to her father. And he said he had this whole speech prepared. But by the time he got there, he forgot the speech because he was so nervous. So he's talking to the father and he says, you know, I want to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And he said something to her. He said, you know, I never forgot these words. He told me, you know, before I give you an answer, I just want to let you know, because the father was aware that they had, you know, been courting. It was not a secret. He said, I want to tell you how much I respect the way that you have carried yourself as a single man. Knowing that he is courting his daughter, but the way, the respect, there was no need to be ashamed. And so he said with that, he gave him a blessing. And why am I bringing this up, brothers and sisters? Because when we allow God to choose for us, when we do things according to his word, the, the, the witness that it is to the world, 
where you don't have to be ashamed, where, okay, if it didn't work out, now you're moving on to the next person, the next person. The reputation becomes marred, brothers and sisters, but reserving that modesty and knowing, wow, God chose me. You know what he said that I thought was so interesting? He said the same impression that God gave him when it came to becoming a pastor, this calling in his life was the same way. He knew that this was the woman for him. Why? Through the word of God. Are we diligent students of the word? Do we know when God is speaking? Do we know when God is saying move forward? Do we know when God is saying fall back? We have to know the voice of God for ourselves, amen? amen? But again, we see that the pair had to be separated. And we see that even in this verse, Adam had a responsibility to protect and cover his wife. I want us to examine Genesis chapter 3, amen? Because there is principles that we see in this fall. And I want to connect this with this falling in love, this falling in lust, and how this affects all that God has planned for us. Because in Genesis chapter 3, what is the first thing that you see with, um, with Eve when she goes to this tree? What, you see these things, but the, the thing that attracts her is emotion. We dealt with this last time, but I don't want to put it to the side. Men and women both have emotions, but women's emotions can often be so strong that it leads them away from reason. Oftentimes they tend to put their emotions, their feelings, what they think, what they desire above the word of God. When she sees this tree, what does the word of God say? Oh, so she saw that it was a tree that was desirous and um, one that would make one wise and it looked so beautiful. And even Spirit of Prophecy says how she saw the serpent and how uh, um, um, beautiful he was. And the fact that he was even speaking didn't even dawn on her like, wow, could this be the fallen foe even though she had all all of these counsels from angels and of God but no she continues to talk oh wow you know and then after she takes of this fruit she feels this high this sense of wow this can't be bad I feel so good if it's so good it can't be wrong right completely rejecting the counsels of God entering into a conversation that she should not have been having. And brothers and sisters, a lot of relationships start off with conversations that should not be had. And we know that as women, we can get caught up in feelings, hearing these words, I love you. There's no evidence of this love, but we like to hear it. We like being told, oh, but he says I'm so beautiful. But he says this. But, he sa but what about what he does? What about what he does not do? The emotions. And you see how that is carried Eve. And brothers and sisters, we feed this to our children. And I want, to, I want you to understand what I'm saying. Because what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with giving your children things to play with. But a lot of times as parents, we don't, we, maybe we've never been taught what a marriage truly is and we're focused more on the wedding but even as children you see little girls with their little dolls the Ken dolls the Barbie dolls and it's so this fixation with marriage and this fixation with children and a lot of women it's more of wow they're castle building spirit of prophecy even talks about this all day they dream about when I'm gonna get married what is my husband gonna look like what are my children gonna look like what type of cake should I have who am I going to invite and we never seek to stop and say Lord is this your will? Lord, my thoughts seem to be having a powerful effect upon me. Take control of it. That's why the word of God says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. Bringing everything into captivity. Do we do that? Or do we let our emotions just run, brothers and sisters? We have to be very careful. The second thing, because that was the first, the emotions, right? We see that in, in Genesis 3, verse 6, if you wanted to take notes. Um, because it says the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. A tree to be desired. Feelings. The second one, dealing with the eyes. Because remember, it's all through the senses that Satan will come. And we have to keep these things under control. The eyes. And I want to bring before you the story of Jacob, right? I don't want to get too into the story, but we see Jacob who comes to Laban, his uncle, after leaving his home. And he starts to work 
seven years so that he could marry Rachel. Was deceived and ended up marrying the older sister Leah. Decided to, well not decided, he worked for seven more years because he wanted Rachel. Then another six years, 20 years where he did not receive his wages. Finally he says to Laban, I want to leave. And Laban says, don't leave, you know, you've done such a great work for, stay, stay. He says, okay, this is what I'll do. Give me all of your sheep, okay? And those that have spots and speckles on them, you can keep. Well, I'm sorry, I will keep. Those that have no spots and speckles, you can take and keep yourself. And Laban's like, oh, this is a great idea because, you know, first of all, nobody wants sheep that have spots or, or speckles on them, right? So he takes these sheep that have these spots and also sheep that have that are white pure and clean and he puts before them these rods right or like these trees that have these spots upon them and what does the bible say it says that the sheep came to eat the sheep came to drink and as they were doing these things and they're staring at these rods thereby beholding we become changed right as they're staring at these rods they begin to mate and what happens they are now being coming changed they are now developing these spots and speckles and the sheep that they're bearing now have these spots and these speckles what is the point of this story brothers and sisters you see this the same example is the same thing that was used in this deception of Eve because what was used to lure her was it not this tree which was also this rod it's the same thing right what did she come to do she came to eat but as she's coming she's beholding what the serpent and becoming changed into his image right because you saw that men were born or made in the image of God but after the fall now it's the image of man so we see this same example because this tree brothers and sisters that many are eating from is not the tree that God has called us to eat from he's called us to come to this cross that is where we are to go and eat of the flesh of God and drink of his blood so that we may become changed into his image that we may receive of repentance but we are not understanding we are not we see these things as very light as very trivial but brothers and sisters Jesus is coming for a church with no spot and no wrinkle but as the church is beholding these things they're becoming changed not into the image of God so we have to be very careful we see these emotions we see the eyes and you can even write well before I go down to even dealing with Jacob you see even with the eyes and this is very interesting calling it the Leah syndrome I'm sure some of you may have heard it or, or heard messages dealing with Leah. I want to focus on her for a little bit because Leah was the one that was the firstborn and she was given to Jacob to marry. And actually, let's go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 29. Amen. Genesis chapter 29 and in verse 16. Amen. Amen. By beholding, brothers and sisters, by beholding Satan and his false theories. Genesis chapter 29, verse 17, 16, I'm sorry. And Laban had two daughters. Are we all there? Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Who did he choose? Who did he want? Rachel, because she was beautiful. Now, the very first thing you see with Jacob, when he saw, actually, go up, go up a little bit in verse 9. I'm sorry, mm, yes, verse 9. Genesis 29, verse 9. It says, and while he yet spake with him, this is Jacob, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice in wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. Now, what did he do? He kissed her. He should not have kissed her, right? We don't know what kind of kiss this is, but we, cannot, we can easily see that this is what led to an emotional attachment between the two because he kissed her prior to her even knowing who he was. It doesn't say that she knew who he was. It says here that Jacob had to tell her, I am your family member. 
So here, before Laban ever stole from Jacob, Jacob had stolen from Rachel. He did not go to the father. No, he went directly to her. But it goes on, it says that Leah was tender-eyed. Do you know what tender-eyed means? She couldn't see well. Her vision was impaired. Now, I want us to understand this when dealing with the Leah syndrome, that we'll call it. This Leah with this vision that was impaired, who does that remind you of? The Laodicean church, right? Blind, they cannot see. So here we have Leah who cannot see, or you can see that lacks this spiritual discernment, desiring for this man to love her, but he does not. He loves Rachel. So what does she do? Going on to uh, verse 30, where it says in Genesis 29, verse 31, and when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. Why isn't it that it was Jacob that named the child? He had no interest, brothers and sisters. You see women having children believing that this is somehow going to win the affections of the man or win the love of the man. But he did not even, he did not even name the child. It says, for she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. No, verse 33. And it says, and she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also, and she called, shall call his name Simeon. Again, she's naming the child because Jacob has no interest. Going on. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time my husband will be joined to me. Now that I'm having this third son, surely he'll want to be one with me. No. It says, because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name was called Levi and she conceived again and bare a son and she said now will I praise the Lord therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing who comes from the line of Judah Christ it wasn't until she received Christ that now she said now I will praise the Lord and she left bearing she wasn't trying to conceive for the purpose now of having this man join with her or having this man love her brothers and sisters oftentimes women and their emotions they will feel as though they have to win the affections of man but we realized and read and studied with Adam Adam saw and knew that she was the one and said this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh God brought the woman to him not the other way around you don't have to go looking for a man sisters God if it is his will will provide and only and only when the man has fulfilled these requirements when they know God's purpose for them in their lives when they have an occupation they have they have something to give this woman because of the occupation they have had they are prepared now to take on this role I'm not gonna get into my whole testimony but even before I was married even before I realized that God had called me to do ministry work and to um, do evangelism. I was a social worker for six years and the exact description in my job was almost parallel to that of which of an evangelism, going door to door, working with people who felt their need, they felt so hopeless and helpless. Doing those things, and at first I was like, Lord, I don't even, I, I don't understand why I'm even here. But now looking back, I understand it was a preparation for what I am doing now. God must prepare us as men and as women for this calling that he has upon us. Amen? But you see this example of Leah trying to win the affection of Jacob. Why? Let's turn to Genesis 29 and verse 31 to, actually, no, that's not where I want to go. I'm sorry. Hmm. We see here that even in Genesis, I believe it's in chapter 3, in verse 16. We can stay there for a moment. God has put something in women naturally. And I'm going to touch on this as we go into the study. But he has, everything that God has put in us naturally, Satan will pervert. Because even where you see in Genesis chapter 3, in verse... 17 amen Genesis 3 verse 17 and unto Adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree which I commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life so because of sin now what does Adam have to do Adam now has to till the ground he has to work now for his food right 
Now, this, although it was saying, it says that in sorrow shall thou eat of it, this was a purpose because this brought joy to Adam because the purpose of it was character building. But you see how Satan has perverted it where people feel as though I don't want to work. I just, my, the, the ultimate goal in life is to get to a point where you can retire early and just enjoy your life. No working involved. You want servants. You want people in your house, maids. And, Brothers and sisters, everything has a role. Working has a role. It is for character building, but everything has been perverted, brothers and sisters. Everything has been perverted. And the number three that I want to touch on is dealing with false doctrines. And I want to go to a scripture that has been misapplied, misinterpreted, misquoted. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And you will see and hear many people quote this text in reference to marriage and why they must hurry up and get married. Regardless of what God has to say, right? False doctrines. Has Satan's devices been taught as doctrines? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I want us to go to verse 9. Actually, verse 8. Actually, verse, yeah, verse 7, verse 7. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. Amen? Amen? It says, For I would that all men were even as I myself. This is Paul speaking. Let's really pay attention. It says, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. How many have heard the scripture? Do you know what it means when it says contain? Temperament or temperance. But this scripture is many times used to turn the concept of conversion into confusion. And even as we're reading this, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, amen? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Are we there? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. All right. Now, it says... Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Brothers and sisters, how can one who has escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust have to hurry up and get married except they burn? Have you thought about that? The connotation is given that some people are so weak and so needy that when it comes to romance and intimacy that they need to marry or they will burn. They, they have preached this idea that marriage is, the, is what gives you power to overcome the lust of the flesh. Not the gospel, not the sanctifying power of the word of God, not the three angels message. It's that, because first of all, conversion is a prerequisite to marriage, but we have made it that marriage is this prerequisite to conversion. Oh, if I get married, then, okay, I'll be able to control myself. Brothers and sisters, no. If you have that mentality, you are going to abuse your spouse. And not only that, you will never feel fulfilled in marriage. You will go outside the confines of marriage to fulfill your lust that you have never had under control because you were never converted to begin with. Do we see that? And if you read this text in its entirety, going back to 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, amen? Let's, re let's really break it down and see what is Paul speaking of. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Are we all there? Amen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the remedy for the problem is not marriage, brothers and sisters. It's the power, the mighty power of the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse... Hmm, it says in verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man has his proper gift of God, one after this man manner, one after another, or after that. Now, it's interesting how people will take what Paul is saying about the marriage and the burning, but they, and they run with it, but yet when it says here, I wish that every man would be as I, why don't they quote that text? Because was he involved in a relationship? No. But why is he saying, I wish that every man would be as I? 
Because when someone is not married, when they are single, they're not hindered. They're able to do the work of the gospel without any hindrances. And he says, I wish that all men could be like that. But it says that every man has their proper gift. Not, God has not called everyone to be single. Some may, that, that may be their calling, but he has not called everyone to also be married. Every man has their own proper gift. Some are to be, even it says in the word of God, to be as eunuchs. But it doesn't say that we must marry because that way we will burn if we don't. That's not what it's talking about, brothers and sisters. Context. Why can't we quote where it says Paul says to be even as I? Single. But nobody wants to hear that. People want an excuse to do what they want to do. Well, I'm with this individual. We've already become intimate. We might as well get married or else we'll burn. Brothers and sisters, that's your mentality. You're already going to burn. Because your understanding of what conversion is and surrender to God... We don't have that. Do you see why it is so important that we know what true heart surrender is before even contemplating a family? I want us to also write down number four. Write down number four. Because what number four is, is basically Satan using women in his first attempt to destroy the church and that's the same way that he will use women in his last attempt to destroy the church. So again, Satan used women or used Eve in his first attempt to destroy the church. And he wants to use women in his last attempt to destroy the church. Let us examine Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Amen. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Okay. We have to know that the counsels of God or even the promises are for those that are in Christ. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. I want us to see in this text where Satan is going to focus his attack and multiply his devices to pervert what God has said. It says in verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. We're going to break down that scripture. But in connection with the first part of that scripture where it says unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. I want us to connect that scripture with 1 Timothy chapter 2. You, we're going to come right back to Genesis, but 1 Timothy chapter 2, amen? 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, amen? amen? It says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue, if they continue in faith, in charity, in holiness with sobriety. Women to be saved in childbearing. Okay? Now, connecting that with Genesis, where it says that the sorrows will be multiplied, what is the spiritual application of this? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Do women have sorrow when it comes to childbirth? Yes, but how greatly those sorrows are multiplied when you are unequally yoked. Now, even the spiritual application of this text, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Looking at that as soul winning. Because as they're not, for those who are true soul winners, and maybe some of us have never experienced, I'm talking about those who really have had a burden for souls. It is through sorrow. It's not as easy as, oh, this person wants Bible studies. Now I'm studying with them and they've accepted Christ. No, brothers and sisters, it can be through long nights of prayer, praying constantly for that person, or having that person not pick up the phone anymore because they no longer want studies. Now you have to go and try and, and first pray, and then go and try and seek and save the lost. Sometimes it's a back and forth. Sometimes they just don't understand it and you feel like wow I have failed at my job and you continue you continue in praying and perseverance brothers and sisters it can be so draining but when you see that it's comparing this to childbirth also or this sorrow your home those children that you have or will have those are your contacts and how sorrowful it is when one spouse is not converted unbeliever with an unbeliever let's even take Christians into account we've already spoken about the fact that being a believer does not so much mean I accept the Sabbath I accept this I accept that do you know Christ do you actually live these things out I believe in the Sabbath but yet your spouse never wants to come to church 
I believe in the Sabbath, but yet when you come home after church with your children because your spouse doesn't want to go, the television is blaring, your children are asking questions, there's confusion in the home. Sorrow, brothers and sisters, as a result of being unequally yoked. Multiplying your own sorrow, brothers and sisters, in ungodly relationships. You also see families where because of maybe upbringing or experiences in life, never having a foundation, never knowing who, what that true love is, you see individuals who have three or four different fathers, all, children with all these different fathers, and it's like, okay, you know, it's, oh, Mr. Colfer, you know, that may be a little offensive, but brothers and sisters, what confusion do you bring in the home where you have now, the children have to go on visitation with all these different individuals, the family members who have this and different ideas of what um, life is or what you should be teaching your children. Confusion, confusion. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have to really pray. We have to really pray and seek God for his wisdom and his counsel, amen? Being unequally yoked. When you look at being yoked, what does it mean to be yoked? What does God say? Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Right? Being unequally yoked, yo being yoked has to do with this yoke of service. But when you see this yoke, it's basically you have these two animals where they would yoke together. One is stronger, one is weaker. And the one that's stronger is the one that's basically pulling most of the burden. Now when you see that God had given us roles with men and women, the man is the one that's supposed to be the head of the home. So when you see this, this yoke, it should be that the man who is stronger than the woman and should understand more is the one that's carrying or leading the family, right? But what does God say? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, and ye shall re find rest unto your souls. There's no way possible you can find rest, especially as a woman, if you are the one trying to pull this burden. When you are the weaker one, and this is not saying women are not strong physically, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that as women trying to pull the burden of the home, while the father is uninterested, what rest can you possibly find? Because you see that this yoke is supposed to be the spiritual application with Christ. Isn't he the one that's supposed to be the one pulling our burdens? Isn't he our husband and we as a church are his wife? Having this equal partnership, brothers and sisters, praying, praying, praying in all things. That's why the spirit of prophecy says that if you see someone that you could even think may be the one, if you're used to praying two times a day, pray four. If you're praying four times a day, pray eight, twice as much because this is where Satan attacks. It's in the families. Individually, yes, but more so in the families to ruin this plan that God has to replenish that number of the angels that have fallen from heaven, amen? The second part of that text also going back to Genesis 3 chapter 16 where it says thy desire shall be to thy husband. Thy husband shall rule over thee. You see that this also has been completely perverted in the world with this whole women's independent movement. <clears throat> and this idea that or lack of understanding when it comes to women submit yourselves you know, to your husbands. Um, they feel as though they have to completely not have any say in the marriage. That's not what it's talking about. Or that they cannot have any opinion. Or, no, that's not what it's talking about. But having your, this desire where your husband shall rule over thee, that desire shall be to thy husband. Satan heard this in the garden. And because of this, he knows what points to attack women way before a husband has even come upon the scene. It's this emotion, it's this desire, you desire to be married. And we touched upon this last time where women feel, and men too, you know, I have to be married. I can't live alone for the rest of my life. I will die if I don't get married. And you know, he's paying attention to me. So you go with whatever attention you're getting. And this has been something that has been going on even in the world, the worldly standards. But I want to read something to you taken from Testimonies chapter, or uh, volume 1, page 421, amen? And isn't the idea in the world to be single and free? You know, oh, I, you know, 
who wants to be married? You know, you got to live it up while you're single because now you're free. Because when you get married, you have to tie the knot. You see all the things that are associated with marriage? Tie that knot because you're never going to be able to be happy again. And even, just as a side note, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties where you see men and women, you know, having intimate relations with people, having strippers come to these parties to celebrate before you actually get married. What perversion has come of this. You're about to unite yourself with someone, become one flesh with them, and grow in grace, and this is what you do the night before? Twisted perversion, brothers and sisters. But reading here, it says, those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called dress reform might as well sever all connection with the third angel's message. The spirit which attends the one cannot be in harmony with the other. The scriptures are plain upon the relations and rights of men and women. This is pretty profound, brothers and sisters. Those who are in favor of women's rights, they might as well sever all ties with the three angels' message because there's no connection with them. There's no harmony. You know, I remember there was a documentary I watched one time dealing with this woman in the women's independent movement. And this woman said, she said, you know, when Adam and Eve before sin, they had dominion over the world, over the earth. But now sin has come into this world. It's time for us as women to now take our dominion back. This is why we wear pants. This is a woman saying this. This is a, a woman who was in her 50s. This is what she This is why we wear pants. This is why we do this. We must take our dominion back. So because we are equal to men. Now, that was what God had intended. We're to be equal, right? But now because of sin, the husband is the head. But put in its proper perspective and understanding this is what can bring true joy and love in any home by understanding your role as a woman, by understanding your role as a husband. I've said this before even with my husband and I, I know what's required of me as a woman, but does that mean that he would not do something for me if I was not able to do it? Should he say, no, I'm not washing those dishes. That's your role. I'm not making it. Where's my dinner? Could you imagine living that kind of life? You know, and I remember when I was younger, I had gone to a relative's home. And even at that young age, I really, you know, I thought it was odd because as soon as it was snowing that day, and the, my cousins were there and everything, and the husband came home. The mother had rushed back home, cooking dinner, you know, trying to clean the house. The husband literally came, and he was covered in snow, right at the front door, took off his hat, threw it on the floor, took off his outer garment, threw it on the floor. All these things, his boots, threw it on the floor, and he's like, where's uh, dinner? She's running, oh, hold on one second. She grabs all the clothes and, you know, putting it, oh, okay, let me make you dinner, and he's complaining about the food, you know, and she's trying to get all these things right, and what does he do? He ends up going to bed. Is that what it means to be submissive to your husband? Is that what it means to be equally yoked? Is that mean, what it means to be a helpmeet? No. God created woman for a purpose, and I actually want to turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. This is, man, God did not desire marriage so that a man could have a slave. No, there's a partnership, there's a purpose. Genesis chapter two, verse 18. Woman was created for man, brothers and sisters, and I want us to see that. In Genesis chapter two, verse 18, it says, are we there? And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And we already studied last week that these are two different things. I will make him and and help me for him. God will make Adam, and then God will give him and help me. But God, women was created for man. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're coming to a close, brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, amen? amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want us to read verses 8 through 9. Amen? amen. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 8 through 9, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. What was woman created for, brothers and sisters? For the man. It is deeply embedded in a woman's makeup 
to be for man a help meet. It is in us. This is our desire would be for man. But the purpose and the purpose of her creation and true happiness is only found in this calling. Well, I shouldn't say only found because you can be perfectly content even as you are single because then you're made for Christ, right? Amen. Now, as a help me, she reflects his character. One more, let's go to another text in 1 Corinthians chapter, well, in the same one, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Woman was to be his help me, brothers and sisters, but, but for what? That the word of God will be fulfilled. Do we see it? Man could not fulfill the will or the word of God without a woman. I want us to go to a couple more scriptures. Let's go to Psalm 144, amen? amen. Psalm 144. Let us see what else woman was created for. Psalm 144, amen? amen. Verse 12. It says, Psalm 144th division and chapter 12. It says that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. The cornerstone what? It connects two angles, right? Right? But in Christ, a woman would be the connection between the father and the children. And do we not see that Christ fulfilled that role? That Christ fulfilled the, this becoming of the cornerstone, connecting the Father in heaven with his children. This is the role, this is the beautiful role that God has even placed upon women, connecting the families. But how could you do this in a relationship in where there's unequally yoked relationships? How could this be done? How could this purpose be fulfilled? And even dwelling more on this um, issue of desire to the husband. I want to touch on something that I believe is a very sensitive topic. Um, for many people because many people are in this situation unfortunately but I want to even dealing with the, this desire to the husband and dealing with the issue of domestic violence because you see that as a result and again as a social worker for as many years I worked with so many women who were victims of domestic violence, more so than anything else. And it was the most difficult thing to work with because out of all the families I had, there was, it was, mm, I would say nine times out of 10, you could not help them because they could not leave their situation. Why? because of all that we just spoke about. They develop, first of all, there's no one that ever taught them what true love is. So they meet this man who's fulfilling the role of the father that they never had earthly, and also this longing for Christ that they don't even know they have. So you meet these men who win them over with words. Physical abuse takes place, and there's a cycle where they're physically abused, and now, I'm sorry, I love you, I can't live without you, and then there's manipulation. If you leave, I will commit suicide, and on then they feel like they have to stay, and it's this back and forth, and when they would come to me for help, I would spend, it was draining, I would spend hours on the phone trying to get them into a domestic violence shelter, and a majority of them would leave within a couple of days. Why? Because this desire that they have for that man, this emotional connection that is so hard to sever which is why it is important as women that we know Christ far before anything else before being careful what we're beholding who we're beholding all these things have an effect upon the mind but with domestic violence you let's I want us to turn this is the last scripture we're going to first Corinthians chapter 3 amen first Corinthians chapter 3 and I want us to read in verse 16. Oftentimes, brothers and sisters, the desire for a husband is greater than reason. The desire is directly in conflict with this chapter right here. I want us to go 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Amen? Amen. And it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 
women, when you did, when, and I'm not saying that it's an easy thing because I, would, I could not imagine being in that situation. I don't believe any woman grows up saying this is the type of situation I want to be in when I get married. This would be ideal. No. They have other ideas of what they would want in their life. But this scripture right here, do you not realize, because another thing was difficult with, with women who are in these type of relationships, is even though police can be called to the home because of the fighting and the arguments, that woman will defend him to the grave. The police will call, they will even take the charges upon themselves. No, 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 you don't understand. Everything's okay, it was me. And they'll even go to jail in place of that man to defend that man. But do you not realize that you are aiding and abetting that individual. You are helping him to break the law of God because it says that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you, and you're defiling that temple by allowing and aiding, abetting, and allowing an individual to put his hands on you, to destroy this temple that God has given us, to destroy this temple that has to serve a higher purpose. We have to, as women and as men, know the value that God has placed upon us, to know that even if you were the only individual on this earth, Christ would have come down from heaven and died for you. Suffer and die for you. Oh, what Christ had to do to help us. You see, even this conflict, I shared it with the, I've shared it many times in my messages, and we were talking about this even last Sabbath, where you see that everything that Adam failed, God, Christ, had to come now and undo. And with blood and sweat and tears, where you see this conflict that Adam had in the garden. Because it says that as soon as Eve came to him with this fruit, he immediately knew what was happening. He immediately knew that she had been deceived. He immediately knew that she had to die. And it says there was this long conflict in his mind. What do I do? Do I eat of this fruit and die with her? God will not give me another wife. What do I do? He remembered the conversations he had with the angels. He started to think about the relationship that he had with Christ. And after all of that, he said, if she has to die, I will die with her. And he quickly took of that fruit and he ate. This conflict that he had, but he made the decision that women, we that represents the church, I will die with the church in their sin. You see the same conflict in the Garden of Gethsemane. Both are in a garden, right? But you see Adam where he failed in the garden, Christ now had to come and overcome. And you see this long conflict with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's sitting there sweating drops of blood, pleading, God, not my will, but thy will. And finally, after pondering and Satan coming at him with temptations, they will never accept this plan of salvation. They will never accept you. You see him with this battle, this separation. Adam chose to have a separation from the Father, chose to have a separation from Christ, but Christ said, Lord, if I die, and the sacrifice is not accepted. I risk losing this relationship that we have. I risk this eternal separation and not one of us can fully understand it because we don't know what it's like to have this unbreakable relationship with God in which we would rather die, in which we would rather not have breath in our body than risk not praying. Daniel felt that way. To tell him you cannot pray was as telling him that he could not breathe the very air which he breathes every day. It was that same concept. But you see that Christ in this agony in the garden chose that at any cost because he saw all of our faces he chose to die for the church he had this agony in this conflict he knew what he was risking but he chose it because he said his love for us was even greater had to undo all that Adam had done, that his purpose in us could be fulfilled. And when we begin to hold, behold Christ, when we begin to understand why was woman created, why was man created, what is the purpose of marriage, our thoughts will begin to change. We will have higher, holier purposes. We will understand that true love is a high and holy principle, not a feeling, not an emotion. We will understand that as a man, your role is to cover and protect your wife, and as a woman, that you are the cornerstone in this wife and husband relationship, allowing the father and the children to be connected as God is to us. But until then, you will see our standard as being as that of the world where people are constantly dating, dating, trying to find the right one, trying to find this love that does not exist in the world, trying to find a love that will die tomorrow as soon as the trials of life come upon you. Brothers and sisters, this subject here is for our own personal 
meditation, our own personal study, because Christ is coming soon and he's looking for a church with no spot or wrinkle individually and also in our families because you will be responsible for the influence that you've had over your spouse and especially for your children. We are responsible for our children. Do we know Christ? Do we reflect his image? Do they see Jesus in us? The very things that we're telling them not to do, do we do? The examples that we want them to have, do we have? You can't expect them to do anything that you do not do. You can't expect them to have a love for Christ that you do not possess. You want them to have joy in the Lord when you don't. You come to these prayer meetings or you come to your um, morning worship and evening worship like, all right, let's, let's get this over with and uh, you know, read these long passages that they have no interest in because our focus is not on our children's salvation. It's not even on our own. We have to pray. We have to pray for this deeper experience, brothers and sisters. Let us have a word of prayer even now. Amen.